Uh, what we will speak about today um, is, of course, disease resistance. And uh, there are different venues to, to know how plants can resist to disease. And what we were interested in is that what part of uh, pathogenicity um, uh, is the target that the plant is uh, aiming at to resist. So uh, in our case, we have uh, found some evidence that um, at least in some resistance lines, uh, resistance of carrot to alternaria dosi is uh, resistance to the toxins that are produced by the fungus. Uh, alternaria dosi is a necrotrophic pathogen. It's one of the worst leaf uh, pathogen of carrot. And uh, disease control classically includes seed treatments, use of fungicide, and crop genetic resistance. And uh, one important thing is that alternaria dosi produce xenial, a secondary metabolite, that is described as a fungal toxin, classically. And uh, plant resistance to what the toxin is uh, partial resistance, horizontal resistance, and uh, non-resistance level are insufficient. And it's very difficult to assess plant resistance to fungi. It's very low throughput. So um, uh, we thought that perhaps if we knew about me resistance mechanisms, instead of looking for actual resistance in the field, we can track the mechanisms themselves and perhaps it will make it easier for breeders to make more resistant cultivars. And also we are interested in mechanism resistance per se because partial resistance mechanisms in general, including Arabidopsis thaliana, are very, very little known. So our hypothesis that we made is that at least in some resistant cultivar, plant cells can resist to fungal toxins. In order to test this hypothesis, uh, we made an um, in vitro culture system that we compared with wall plant results. Wall plant results were obtained using a drop inoculation technique that I already presented earlier, where you inoculate each leaf with a certain number of drops, and you know the, num the volume of each drop. So you know how many conidia of the fungus you have on the leaf, and so you know afterward you can compare the number of symptoms with the number of conidia you had on the leaf. And it's a way to, as precise as possible, to measure plant resistance. And we compare that with another system where we produce uh, cell plant cell suspensions from uh, friable cali, and uh, in, we confront them with fungal exudates that are very raw. We grow the fungus in liquid culture, and then we filtrate mycelium out, and that's what we put in the, in the cell growth medium. And after you have added that, of course, the plant cells don't like it very much. But is there a correlation between how bad they react to fungal extract, these cells, and how bad the plant leaf react to fungal conidia, to the whole fungus? So the results we obtained at the first level were by using uh, embryogenesis methods. Here you have different plant cell cultures uh, that uh, are in different levels in embryogenesis. The symbol minus, there is no embryogenesis, and in fact most of the cells are dead. At the plus sign you have a little bit of embryogenesis, but if you wear, wait long enough you have uh, large viable embryos. Uh, plus plus, of course, embryogenesis is going well, and when you have three pluses, it's profuse. It's very strong, very fast embryos. You are at the same scale here. Embryos go very fast, and they are enormous. So here you have two plant lines, H1 and K3, and when you test them in field, H1 is susceptible to alternaria, and K3 is resistant. And when you grow them, you can make, of course, uh, plant cell suspensions. And uh, very fast, without using any hormones, you ha will have some embryogenesis. That is relatively at the same rate and is standard embryogenesis level. If you add some more extract, H1, all the cells die. 
And even the cells that don't die, they don't move anymore, they don't make anything, and that's it. And K3 produce embryos. So here you have the first hint of a correlation between wall plant fungus resistance and plant cell resistance to the fungal extracts. So the problem is you have only two cultivars, two lines. Plant cells from H1, they are damaged. Is this toxicity or is this some unspecific effect? Plants from K3 are unaffected. Is this genotype resistance or is this a coincidence? So if you want to go beyond that, you will have to add several genotypes and to see that there is a correlation between uh, plant resistance to the fungus and plant cell resistance to fungal extracts. So here you have a selection of several uh, plant lines. You have the very well-known cultivars Presto that is rather susceptible on Bolero that is resistance. And here you have four lines, H1 which is very susceptible, K3 which is very resistant, and H4 and I2 that are uh, rather resistant for I2 and intermediate for H4. When you grow them, they produce embryos. There's no problem about that. If you add fungal extract, this is what you obtained. The two susceptible cultivars, they don't grow anymore. The three resistant cultivars, they continue to grow and to make embryo very fast. And the one we love is H4, because H4, which is intermediate, which we don't know if you say is susceptible or resistance, sometimes it makes embryos and sometimes it doesn't. And it's the first time I like to have a mixed result. It's just in the middle, it's perfect. Nevertheless, it is rather qualitative, it is not quantitative. So in order to have more quantitative results, what we did is we used a way to measure general metabolism of plant cells. And plant cells contain tons of plant cell esterase. And plant cell esterase, among other things, they can degrade a molecule called FDA, fluorescein deacetate, that is non-fluorescent, into fluorescein, that is a fluorescent molecule. And you have here plant cells that are alive because they have degraded FDA into fluorescein. The result you have here is, in here you have the whole plant susceptibility. It is a number of symptoms. It's a, we are under disease progression cure, but it is linked with symptom numbers. And here you have the plant cell esterase activity in the presence of raw extract. What is very interesting is that the figures are above 100. That is, in fact, what we see is not what we expected. We expected in resistant cultivars to have the same activity with or without the toxin, and in susceptible cultivars to have activity destroyed by the toxin. Here in the susceptible cultivar, you have somewhat lower activity, but it's not enormous, and in the presence of resistant cultivars, you have a very strong enhancement of the activity of the plant cell in the presence of the fungal toxins. We can't explain that right now, but we have ideas. Okay, now the next thing is what are these plant cells resisting to? They are resisting to fungal extracts, but you have hundreds or thousands of molecules in the fungal extract. You don't know what you are um, using. So in the first very raw state, what we did is it just very simple, uh, an aqueous separation, aqueous and organic phase, and uh, the result is rather nice. When you put the aqueous phase, nothing occurs. You have the same result that if you put nothing. And if you add the organic phase, you almost have the same results as with the raw extract. So all the toxicity of the fungus is in the organic phase and not in the aqueous phase. And uh, if you use it using FDA measurements, you have this. This is the activity in the presence of the organic extract. This is the activity in the presence of the raw extract. And you have a very good correlation. So there is one compound that is uh, in the organic phase. And it is zinol. And zinol is described as the fungal toxin. So we thought, OK, uh, the plant resists to zinol. Let's prove it. Well, to prove it, it's more or less easy. You have to synthesize pure, pure zinol and to check that it is toxic and that resistant plant resists to it. So 
We have some uh, collaborators in SONAS, which is a chemistry uh, a laboratory here in Angers University, which did the wool synthesis of zinol for us. And we added zinol to cell suspensions. Then we confronted that with fungal exudates that we grow in different ways, um, with or without oxygen and in different media to check using UH UHPLC methods that there is indeed zinol in our uh, uh, cultures. And then things went bad. Well, I don't know if it's bad, but the result was not what we expected, but in general it was good, in fact. So we tested several concentrations of zinol, very low concentration, standard concentration, that means the kind of concentration you can expect in fungal extract, and enormous concentration. And the result is this. In, normal, in low concentration, nothing occurs. In normal concentration, nothing occurs. And at very high concentration, everybody is killed. Sooner or later, if you put tons of it, everybody is killed. So here, what you see is that zinol is not very toxic. That is, in normal concentration, zinol does not affect carrot cells. So zinol is, yeah, it's toxic if you put tons of it, but it does, the toxicity of zinol does not explain uh, the pathogenicity of the fungus, and uh, the, to the toxicity of zinol uh, uh, does not explain what is going on, and resistance to the fungus is not resistance to zinol. So there is no toxicity of zinol, and there is no specific reaction. So zinol starts to go a bit out. There is a second thing. We grew the fungus with or without oxygen. The standard method we used was with oxygen. And in the presence of oxygen, fungal extract kills susceptible cells and not resistant cells. And there is no zinol. This peak is not zinol, 8.26. Zinol is 8.36. So in the presence of oxygen, there is no zinol. And the fungal extract is toxic. In the presence of oxygen, there is zinol. And there is no difference in the results. So zinol has nothing to do with uh, the fungal toxicity. So as a conclusion, there is a role for toxin, in resist to toxin resistance in quantitative resistance. Um, we have found a correlation between whole plant quantitative disease resistance and plant cell resistance toward fungal toxins. And this is something that was never seen elsewhere before. And uh, the toxicity factors for the moment are completely unknown. We know they are hydrophobic compounds, perhaps, probably a secondary metabolite, but we are not sure. Uh, what we are sure is that it is not zinol, and so now we are underway in trying to characterize this, th these toxins. Uh, I would like, before the question, to thank all the people who helped us in this work. You can see that there are a lot of people in here. And uh, especially Michael Lecomte, who did uh, most of the actual work in the lab that uh, I presented you today during his PhD. So now I am ready for questions. Um, sometimes um, what you find on the single plant in the lab for, you know, whether it's susceptible, does not occur in the field. So it'd be really nice if you could go all the way. Okay, uh, this work is uh, part of a more general work. The lines I shown you were prepared, among other people, by Valérie Leclerc and Mathilde Briard, um, with the purpose of mapping um, resistance. So um, there is a good correlation uh, between, as I uh, as I shown you, between wall plant resistance and uh, plant cell resistance, and the, m the, the greenhouse methods that we used uh, give results that are very well correlated with field results. So, uh, I mean, Bolero is resistant. K3 probably is more resistant than Bolero. Presto is susceptible, and H1 is, it's not probably, it is more susceptible than Presto. So there's no problem about that. And H4 is somewhere in the middle, and you can't tell if it's resistant or susceptible. And you have these results in the field, repetitively, uh, year after year after year. No problem. Right, 
Yeah, a question to the senior and how did you uh, how did you apply it? Because I, I think senior is also a hydrophobic molecule and the extract. Yes. So can mm. can you uh, be sure that the application of your senior is acts in the same way like you uh, applied the, the so senior uh, is hydrophobic but not completely. Uh, you can. Put some zinnol in uh, in um, in aqueous solutions, and uh, more than that, we did not put zinnol alone. Uh, we did uh, put DMSO, and all the results were compared with uh, carrot cells in the presence of DMSO without the zinnol. And uh, when you add DMSO, it has no effect. Uh, when you add zinnol, it it has no effect also. And if you add tons of zinnol, it kills everything. And in fact, it correlates with results that were obtained previously. People who uh, zinnol is the main secondary compound if you grow the fungus for a very long time. So, for very understandable human reasons, the main compound was to die first. And when you put tons of it, it's toxic. So people said it is the toxins, but it is not. I don't know whether you have uh, checked the, uh, the osmolarity, whether these uh, supposed toxins have an effect on the uh, uh, torgo of both cells that get affected. Because you had this slide where you used FDA as, yes. a, as a detective, yes. a detection agent, and uh, the esterases are known to be very stable. They even continue to work a long time after death of a specific cell. Mm -hmm. And we used FDA to measure the, the amount of viable pollen by counting pollen grains that were glowing and those that were not. And the difference between these two types of pollen cells was that the, the cells that didn't glow had a ruptured membrane. And the, the, the esterases had escaped, and that's why you couldn't detect the signal inside of these cells. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the system is this way. Um, FDA is rather hydrophilic. Uh, it can go in and out of plant cells. Uh, it is degraded in, by esterase into fluorescein. Fluorescein is hydrophobic. It stays inside the plant cells. It cannot move out. Uh, because of membranes, etc. And uh, because of that, when you see fluorescence inside the cells, you have several steps that prove that this, you have uh, cell um, membrane integrity. Uh, in fact, the results I've presented you today are results that were obtained from extracts. And uh, I agree with, I, I partly agree with you when you say that. Uh, Perhaps the high level of fluorescence we see first is fluorescence that is in the extract. It's possible. But uh, in fact, we did some experiment when we, look, we looked at the cells themselves, and we looked at the fluorescence of the cells uh, in micro by microscopy. And uh, what we saw is that the more you wait with cells in the presence of toxins, the less you have fluorescence. The toxins produced by the fungus probably have a long-term effect. They don't act. They don't kill the cell in one hour or even in 10 hours. They kill the cells slowly but surely in several days. <laughs> 